About a year ago, I was introduced to True Niogen, a supplement specifically designed to boost a key cellular resource called NAD. That's short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And I was really impressed with the research that showed that increased NAD levels can promote cellular repair, maintain healthy mitochondria, and increase energy throughout the trillions of cells in our body. I've been taking True Niogen ever since, and I am truly persuaded, which is why I'm so excited to welcome them back to the program. Let's get into how True Niogen works. From age 40 to 60, humans can experience a 50% decline in NAD, leaving our cells with a shortage of that incredibly valuable energy resource. Additionally, things like immune stress, poor diet, even alcohol consumption can all deplete our cell NAD levels. Research suggests that increased NAD can support cellular defense against these physiological stressors. True Niogen is designed to boost NAD levels and is backed by clinical research and regulatory approvals. Now, while the research is still evolving, I am truly impressed by the possibilities surrounding NAD and the research behind True Niogen, and I suggest you check out their information for yourself. To learn more about the research, science, and to order your supply of True Niagen supplement, visit drdrew.com slash true and use the code DREW at checkout for a special discount on orders of three bottles or more. So that's my website, drdrew.com slash T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N, and use the code DREW today. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Good morning, and thank you to our friends at True Niagen. Uh, see you guys all piling in here, Teresa and uh, Brian. Sorry you got uh, mask shamed this morning, but here we are. It's early in some parts of the country, not so much in others. Uh, we are here to uh, welcome our guest. Uh, his name is Dr. Michael Dubois Blanc. He is a surgeon. Uh, he began his practice at the John Muir Medical Center in 2000. Does advanced lapar laparoscopic procedures, uh, and he's been a trauma surgeon at John Muir since beginning his pra practice, as well as having been deployed overseas with the U.S. Army Reserve as a surgeon. Dr. Dubois Blanc, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me on. So Dr. Dubois Blanc is here because he had the unfortunate um, experience of getting into the crosshairs of the press uh and he experienced something that i'll explain in a minute called gelman amnesia which is where you learn how distorted and uh, incredibly full of shit the press is sorry to say it like that um but tell us what happened in your case well uh i mean it, as everyone knows the uh the, the covid19 um uh you know treatment really uh, began uh, around March 16th when our county went into a shelter in place order uh, to really try and flatten the curve and, and prevent spread of this. And, uh, you know, it, it dramatically changed sort of the injury pattern that we were seeing. I mean, our, our numbers for trauma patients uh, dropped dramatically. And, uh, uh, you know, the hospital was making a lot of arrangements to uh, prepare, you know, for an anticipated uh, tremendous amount of patients. And um, so our numbers, our, our, our trauma numbers were down, but we started seeing, you know, more domestic violence. We started mm -hmm. seeing more um, self uh, intentional harm. And uh, in the middle of April, you know, we experienced uh, a, a, just a terrible uh, week of uh, suicides, uh, successful successful suicides where people came in with uh, mortally inflicted intentionally harmed injuries that we you know we couldn't save and um you know we started looking uh just just briefly at our our numbers and it, it seemed like there was a huge huge increase in in these numbers and um so let, we, let me we stop let me just stop you let me just stop you and so yeah. what so to frame Further frame what you're saying is so we took what are called non non pharmacological interventions. We took uh, you know sheltering and distancing and all these things. Um, this was our treatment. This was what our public health officials told us to do as the treatment. Um, it was somewhat preventative, but it was also a treatment right. strategy. And you and I know whenever, as practicing clinicians out in the world, whenever we apply a treatment, we are immediately doing a risk reward analysis in our head. Yeah. And it seemed to me that the public health officials did no such thing. They didn't even contemplate what the potential adverse effect of their of their moves could be. And 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 I'll defend them on that because it was a fog of war at the time, right? I mean, we right. were all kind of confused what was going on. But it became pretty clear pretty quick that there was a lot of adverse impact, and, and they continued to ignore it. 
Uh, would you agree with that that assessment? Well, I, I think I think that you know history will will make that final determination. But you know, I think I think uh, when we didn't see the huge numbers of of patients, at least in this area, you know, this is a very regional disease mm-hmm. um, that. That you know, you gotta kind of adapt and, and change your game plan a little right. bit. But right. I mean, let's say you're in a you're you're doing a surgery, and all of a sudden you got a bleeder. You're you're changing your plan. <laughs> you're gonna do something different, right? Right. You yeah. gotta you gotta you gotta adapt to the the uh, the numbers and the environment that you're in. And right. you know, our our whole point of coming out was was just to to you know let people know that hey, there are resources out there. Uh, you know, check in on, on your loved ones, um, you know, uh, get help before it's too late because I mean, well, com- complete the story, um, tell, tell them what happened, what, what you did and what happened. Yeah. So, so we went, we went out and we, we did a news article, uh, and, and, and basically, um, you know, we explained, uh, what we were seeing and, and, uh, we wanted to get the message out there to, to, to get people help and, and to hopefully prevent some further uh, suicides or suicide attempts. And, um, you know, what happened was, uh, afterwards the, the reporter was kind of talking to me and, and she was asking me about the shelter in place. And, and I, I started talking a little bit about the shelter in place and that was sort of my mistake is, you know, that, that was sort of a, a side message, but, you know, I was, I was talking about, you know, flattening the curve and, you know, our numbers are down and, uh, the hospital's ready uh, you know, the, the hospital here made, they moved mountains to sort of get ready for this, this surge of patients. This I was, mean, this was not unusual. This was the, this was the, and by the way, many of those hospitals are now in severe financial trouble from exactly. I mean, our, our, our hospital volume was, uh, down by over two thirds. I mean, uh, there was no patients hardly in the hospital. They canceled all elective surgeries. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by the way, that that of itself has a whole set of adverse outcomes associated. Absolutely. With it. And I can yeah. talk about that later, too. But yeah. I mean, it it was, uh, you know, uh, we, we basically doubled the number of ICU beds we had. We were training nurses and, and, you know, military type teams to take care of patients. I mean, we were ready. It was it was a true show of force that the hospital did here. I was I was like amazed. Yeah. And um and so that you know the, the the patients never really came, and and we started seeing side effects. And so I was I was talking about the shelter in place, and the next thing you know, you know the headline is you know doctor calls for end of shelter in place. Uh, to, you know there's more <laughs> there's more suicides than COVID deaths, uh, and so that that went sort of viral, and then you know that that kind of played its course, and then a week later we've got the the other side of the press trying to discredit me. Uh, trying to, you know, uh, say that I was a liar, you know, uh, you know, really just sort of distorted the whole message. Um, right, right. So, so, so what did you learn about the, there's a lot to unpack here, but what did you learn about the, <laughs> what did you learn about the press, about being in the press? Well, you know, uh, y- you need to be extremely precise in how, and what you say and how you say it. Because if, if there's a little bit of wiggle room there, the press will just uh, uh, take it. Oh, uh, it doesn't matter how precise you are. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if you have an opinion, you will get thrashed. And yeah, I mean, just look, look at look at. I mean, the easiest thing to look at is just the science around hydroxychloroquine. I, oh I, my god! I, I, I don't know about you, but I've been using hydroxychloroquine for decades. Uh, oh my god! And, and I was saying, I you know, I, I'm an internist, so I just do a lot of rheumatic disease and stuff. And so yeah. I, I, Plaquenil was a standard medication, particularly back when I was in training. We did a lot of it back then. Yeah. And uh, I used to use chloroquine, straight chloroquine for malaria prophylaxis, which, by the way, is available over the counter throughout the world. It's so safe. But uh, suddenly people who'd never been able, never heard the word hydroxychloroquine were, had clinical expertise. Suddenly they knew exactly what this medicine was and how dangerous it was or wasn't. In the right. probably... 500, how many, maybe 100, how many, how many patient years did I accumulate? Many, 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 many patient years of prescribing I, I accumulated. Uh, we would send people to the ophthalmologist once a year. There's a retinal thing that happens after 10 years. There's a corneal thing that can possibly happen after one. So every year they went to the ophthalmologist. Never saw a single ophthalmological adverse event, which was all we worried about. Never saw a single adverse side effect. I can't say that of Tylenol or aspirin. 
Never yeah. saw an adverse effect with Plaquenil, though. <clears throat> yeah, and yet, and, then, and yet uh, people became experts overnight. Yeah, and then you saw what happened in the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, which is just devastating. Well, describe what you saw there. I've tried to. It, it's a hard thing. That's a hard. Really, the devastating part about it was that it froze real research in place. Real well, research yeah, was I being mean, it done. Canceled froze. all of these clinical trials. Yes, all of the clinical trials that were in progress to actually determine whether or not this drug was of, of a benefit were were canceled. Yes. I mean, it actually impacted people's, you know, potentially uh, their survival. So, so, so let's, you know, let's, and that's let's, all, let's, it was let's describe all what that was political or yeah, financial. I don't know what, right. well, not medicine, whatever it is, not medicine. And, and when did the press start practicing medicine? See, that's the thing <laughs> that's getting me upset. Uh, I've got a headline here from, let me just play it for you. It's uh, The Hill on March 24th. New York Times editorial boards demands a national lack lockdown for coronavirus. Editorial board determining non-pharmacological interventions and public health policy? Since yeah. when? What what world am I living in? Right? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, you know, I think, you know, science has somewhat failed us and and the <sighs> You know, there's there's there is no true science on this virus. It's a completely new virus, and you know, I think it's frustrating when uh, the government comes out and says, "No, you don't need to wear masks," and then the next week they're saying you wear masks. Right. There's uh, different uh, you know directions and lockdowns, and I mean, all of these things sort of uh, create distrust in in the whole system well but you and i know that science there's no truth in science there's just evolving theory and, and hypothetical hypotheses uh, and, right. and so to us you know adjusting and you know this is all part of what we always do but people that are looking at people that are claiming uh, that they're following following science and then taking very um uh, I don't know, how do I say this? Deliberate or extreme measures on behalf of science, and then defending the behalf of science, even as the science was changing, that that's what kind of made it rough. And, and I don't know that yeah. science failed us. It's just that look, models are models. They're not science. They're just mathematical models to help us sort of understand where we are. The science right. is what's getting done right now, and all the the clinical trials that are underway. And, and by the way, we did we're doing a big scientific experiment right now. If, if we well, observational study at least in terms of these demonstrations and let's see how the virus transmits in in the out of doors and we're going to get right. a lot of information from that and it looks like there's going to be next to no transmission at least at this point in in you know the evolving whether it's the life cycle of the virus or the seasonality of the virus and that we just don't yeah. know right yeah i mean the way that the virus is changing is is certainly very interesting yeah uh, it's hard it's hard to explain because it's it's a. Uh, you know, it's it's not a normal normal thing to watch this thing track across the world, and um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how this is going to pan out exactly, but uh, you know, the, probably the most upsetting thing for me was when our our county came out and you know, said that, you know, physicians often have their own opinions based on their own, uh, you know, practice patterns and experiences, but we are following science. Mm. You know, that's what the county said in response to my comments. And, oh boy. you know, I'm not aware of any science of uh, pulling the plug on the economy, no. you know, uh, sheltering in place for six to eight weeks, uh, taking away uh, people's entire support system, isolating them, uh, either uh, losing your job, uh, going on an un unemployment. I mean, those sort of stressors. Uh, there's no, there's no science on what happens when you do that to people. That, that's right. Uh, and and let's be clear: the, this so-called science of lockdown is a non-science. It's not science. It's it's a a notion. Are you aware of the history of uh, lockdown uh, as as a intervention? The where, where that came from. Well, not in my not in my lifetime. <laughs> right. So, so it was a model developed by a young fifteen uh, year old in a high school project in Albuquerque, and it was in two thousand six. And her father was a computer programmer who thought, "Oh, this is an interesting model. I think she's onto something." Published a paper where he put her as the number two author, uh, where he modeled closing down schools essentially and other localized measures of lockdown 
as a way of decreasing transmission of influenza. Now, influenza is primarily transmitted through children. COVID is not. So even the very basic assumptions of that model were not applicable to this situation. But in 2006, the Bush administration adopted that as a policy, and it became applied for the first time in history in, in this setting. Probably right in Italy, probably right in New York City, but, but not necessarily right in the rest of the country because there's no science. There's literally no app. No one has ever done it and studied the outcome. It's never been done. There's just been a model, a suggestion of how to approach this. And as in never before in medical history have we quarantined healthy people. And you were just saying, hmm, you're looking at that as a treatment model and going, hey, it's had some other effects. It's brought out mental illness. And by the way, in addition to the mental health issues, which I'm seeing like you are like crazy, 8 to 15-year-old children and young adolescents are being affected so profoundly by this, I'm fearful it will affect the development of the rest of their life. And no one, no yeah, one is giving no any doubt. thought to that. There's no doubt this affects children. Uh, you know, and those that's our future. So, I mean, it, it, the effects on, I agree, the effects on children are totally unknown. And, uh, you know, everything, everything this summer, all of their activities have basically been canceled up here. Mm -hmm. uh, no sports. Uh, I guess they can go to like brief summer camps. I mean, uh, just, just crazy, well, and, crazy and, impact. But, but forget the fact that they're losing their recreation and their developmental milestones of interacting with their peers. They're, they're, sheltering in place. That's something you do when there's an active shooter outside. We're telling them, stay inside, close the door. There's a, there's a, there's a monster outside waiting to kill your family. My yeah. God. And you're eight years old. Imagine what that's like. Yeah. Really yeah. Sad. That's going to have a, a long-term effect on their psyche. I'm afraid. So. And, it might. Uh, we don't know the back to the science. We don't know, but somebody's going to have to measure that someday. And we'll see. Yeah. Um, so, so you you went out and you got uh, smeared uh, for merely talk for merely showing, being a clinician, observing and trying to help the public uh, be aware of the adverse outcomes associated with the interventions. Um, yep. How dare you? First of all, how dare you be a clinician? How dare you have an opinion? Um, you felt nowhere, nowhere do you ever discover how much the press distorts everything than when you yourself are the object of a story. Um, yeah. I, I was actually talking to Larry King about this a couple weeks ago, and I said, Larry, because he, he, they, they did a smear story on me too, and I said, Larry, you know what it's like. They, do, how many times have you been in the press, and the stories, do they, do they ever get it right? Do they ever get it right? And he said, no, never, never. They, they, never, they never stop to really report the truth. That's not of interest to them. Their interest is is pushing a narrative, a story, uh, and, and they're trained to look for the story. I mean, think about that. And so you and I are trained to look for the truth, uh, or at least you know, as as a, an approximation of the truth as best we can get. There's there's something called Gelman amnesia. So there's a famous physicist named Dr. Gelman who apparently was <coughs> quoted as saying, or he somehow he got into the press where he was um, evaluating the press. He was a physicist, and he was evaluating the press's reporting on physics, and he just was like, they never get it right. It's always way off the facts of the science. They never get physics right when they report it. And then he said he'd go on to read the rest of the paper and assume these very complex topics like international relations and economics. Well, that they got right. Well, the fact is, that's the amnesia. It's a, we have amnesia when we look at the stories on topics that we know, we see how far off the mark they are. When they run stories on us, we see how distorted and dishonest it is. But then we assume the rest of the paper is accurate. That's called Gelman amnesia. Yeah. It's rough, yeah, man. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good description. <laughs> of yeah. Kind of my, that's a, that was my new interpretation of how the press works. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, nobody, nobody called me. Nobody really followed up on any of these things. Uh, they just wrote what they wanted to write. And then uh, when it was time to actually defend myself, the, the person that, you know, the, the author I was talking to, I mean, he just did not want to hear anything I had to say. So. Right. They, they've done, they've got their clicks. You actually literally have to hire an attorney and sue them. Uh, that's all you can do. And they will hide behind. But it costs millions it of costs dollars. It costs millions of dollars. It, they will hide behind the First Amendment. 
And they will, and the only other thing you do is is uh, to drop your subscriptions, which Susan, I, I do want to, except for maybe the Sunday paper, we got to drop that subscription. We already did that. Oh, good. Um, it, it yeah, is. but then they but then they keep giving you the papers. I mean, we've had it. We've had the newspaper here, and we stopped uh, paying for it like a year ago, and they keep delivering it. It's oh, like that would they, be great because it's ninety nine dollars a month. Yeah, that that's <laughs> fine. That's well. fine. That's fine. Keep delivering it. That, that's not a business model. Good luck, you guys. Enjoy. <laughs> exactly. You, you, I, I, that's fine. I, I don't mind that. That I'll happily read it for free. It's, well, Ooh, let's try that. I'm sorry you went through that. It's very distressing. The the feelings of powerlessness are sort of uncanny, right? I mean, you you in anger and 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 hurt. Well, right? I mean, it makes you it makes you think twice about trying to do the right thing. Um, and I'm you know I I I get it. You know I, whatever whatever they need to do to to sell their their you know subscription or whatever, but. But I, I just I want the the public to know that you know uh, you know there's there's people out there trying to do the right thing and and don't don't obviously read read and uh, you know believe everything you you see in print that's for sure. How, how are things going now at your institution? And this is the John Muir Hospital at Walnut Creek. Is yeah, it's John Muir in the Walnut Creek. Uh, I mean, we're still uh, our our trauma volumes are coming back up. Um, you know we. Uh oh, I think he locked up here. As we have an internet, Please. there you go. I'm sorry, you locked up for one second. Say that again. Your your trauma sir, trauma numbers are up, and yeah, I mean our trauma our trauma volumes have uh, basically uh, returned to to you know seasonal normal. Um, there was some recent looting in the area uh, and riots, sort of, but but those have calmed down. So we're we're back we're back to normal from a trauma standpoint. How about the the mental health issue? Well, we're still seeing we're still seeing a lot of intentional harm. Um, you know, the, the the degree of injury that we've had has just been, you know, pretty pretty uh, major uh, injuries. We've been able to help. Uh, you know, a lot of people have recovered from their injuries. Um, you know, they're, they're it, still these, coming in. Yeah, are this mostly gunshot wounds that we were talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah, self-inflicted gunshot wounds, stab wounds, uh, people jumping yeah. uh, in front of cars, uh, trains. Th those are oh the sort gosh. of you know horrible injuries we see. And, and when when you talk to the patients as they recover, do, do you get any sense of where you know how they articulate the distress, or is it just a mood? You know, I I would argue that just the chronic stress of this and the lack of ability to plan a future and those sorts of things are enough to give somebody a depression that could be associated with suicidality. But I'm just wondering if they have specific complaints. Yeah. I mean, we haven't, uh, obviously the ones that, uh, you know, don't survive aren't, aren't able to really tell us much, but uh, you know, the ones that uh, it's not unusual for people to survive their injury. And then the next day uh, you know, they have, they have a, a completely, you know, new, new look at life and they want to live. Oh, oh, listen, uh -huh. that's why we put people on hold for 72 hours. The suicide thinking and, and feelings go away. And uh, yeah. pe people that survive jumps, th they always say the same thing if they survive. As soon as they jump, their next thought is, this was a huge mistake. Next thought. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not it's not unusual for, for us to, to see these people. And then, you know, the psychiatrists come in and see them. And, and they're like, yeah, they're, they're, they're no longer suicidal. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. So, I mean, this is a temporary, uh, you know, a temporary feeling that oftentimes becomes a, a, a permanent, uh, you know, solution. Right. So we really want to, we really want to, you know, encourage, uh, you know, families to reach out to your loved ones, uh, you know, friends, call, call your friends, uh, see, check in, see how they're doing, uh, you know, and just, uh, you know, be a, be a good neighbor, you know. That's that's really what it's about to try and prevent these things. Yeah, uh, connection, support, observe observe people. Don't assume suicidal thinking is a, it's in a medical emergency. Deal with it accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Um, any any uh, sex predominance, males, females? It's mainly young males. You mm -hmm. know, 20, 30, 30 year old males. That's those are the those are the ones that really take aggressive. Uh, you know, action towards their, their feelings. Um, the other thing know. I'm seeing a lot of, and I'm wondering if this is a confounding variable in some of these cases you're seeing, but a marked escalation of alcohol. 
Are, are you seeing substance or alcohol figuring into these cases uh, and or are you seeing an uptick in alcohol related phenomena? You know, it's hard to know because our our population is so skewed towards alcohol and drugs uh, normally. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these are these are people who are high risk uh, normally. So, I mean, we have, uh, you know, probably two thirds, two thirds of all of our patients have some some form of substance abuse or acute intoxication Great. normally. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to I'm going to say that's figured into this. Because uh, addicts don't do well uh, left to their own devices, so yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, we don't we don't have the the data uh, on overdoses, um, but but those seem to be increasing as well. Yeah, uh, do you guys have substance treatment, primary treatment up there, or is it all sort of outpatient medical management, all that stuff? Well, I mean, we have a behavioral health uh, center that's associated with the hospital. Um, so we send a lot of people there. They in in the behavioral health, they have a big addiction, uh, you know, clinic. Okay, um, okay. It's not it's it's not available to everybody due to funding uh, issues. Um, that's really a big problem. Um, we 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 do a tremendous amount of detox on our service. You know, people who come in with just very very severe, you know, chronic alcoholism, they go through major. DTs and detox while they're on our service. And your service um, being the su surgical service, trauma service. Yeah, the trauma service. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the reality of the treatment of uh, addiction and alcoholism is that it's a terrible business done properly. There's just not enough resources in the world to properly treat all the addicts and alcoholics we have in our country. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's extremely time intensive, it's extremely staff intensive, labor intensive. Uh, and the un one of the other unfortunate features is 12-step mutual aid societies, which now we have uh, data out of Stanford and, and Harvard that show it as effective as any professionally managed interventions, has been under attack for the last 10 years. And it's free and it's on every corner. How we can attack a free service that is efficacious, to me, is just anathema. It's just beyond me. Uh, so it, it, I understand the resistance to participating in 12-step. I get that. I mean, we, I dealt with that all the time. But to attack it is just a horrible plan. So that's just my little public service announcement. Yeah. They're all closed right now, though. What? I mean, they're no, they don't have uh, well, AA can, meetings. No, you can meet up to 10 people. Oh, uh, you can? Yeah, they've started having some. It depends where you are. I mean, every, it's rolled out differently everywhere. I mean, the state is allowing it in California. Where Where is Walnut Creek? <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's in the San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> it's in the East Bay. East Bay Area, so I mean, it's, yep. so it's an urban, an urban setting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's urban, suburban yeah, setting. So, all right. Well, listen, we I really appreciate you spending a little time with us, and I appreciate you speaking out just to <clears throat> give people a sense of uh, again the, the risk reward analysis we do with every yeah. intervention, and to start to deal with the and, and and I would and I've not maybe not articulated this clearly enough yet. I, I don't take issue with the lockdown. I, I get that they had to do something and it was a fog of war and they were unclear yep. and they needed to buy time. I have no problem with that. I have no problem. But I would then, agree. 100%. Yeah. But then to not look at the consequence and not listen to clinicians, that's the most bizarre thing I've ever heard in my life. Again, that's like having the editorial board making, determining public health policy. I mean, that is, I, I mean, oh, I, that's the Twilight Zone stuff, in my opinion. Well, I think I think what happened was sort of the goal the goalposts changed. I mean, initially it was to flatten the curve uh, and slow this disease spread down, and then what they saw was, oh my God, we've flattened the curve so much, we've almost eliminated this disease in the community. Let's just keep this going. Right, and I don't. I'm not sure that was a conscious switch, because the, to when you hear them talk about it, they will conflate. They will start talking about death, daily death rates, and then flattening the curve as those as those as though those are the same priorities and goals. Right. These are no one ever set out to reduce the number of deaths from COVID. Nobody. Yeah. And the CDC never recommended a lockdown. They recommended social distancing. They never recommended a lockdown. That was the government. But again, I don't fault them. Uh, they were preparing for the worst case. I get it. It was confusing. But yeah. once they did those things, because they're not scientists, they're not clinicians, I, I think they lost their way. Uh, and, and think of it now. I mean, just think of the, how they're even the public health officials, you know, uh, three weeks ago, 
the those kids at that Ozark pool were 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 murdering their grandparents. They were going to murder right. their grandparents by being at that pool. Now yeah. demonstrators are heroes who are risking their own life. I, I mean, that's not science. That's not science. You, you, you can't. You can't. It's it's like, hey man, people are going out. Let's take a look at how it plays out. Please please distance and wear a mask so we don't squander this opportunity to continue to make progress uh, or let let this thing die out with the um, and finish what we've done. Finish the work you've, we've done so well. I mean, we should be congratulating ourselves. You know, it really. surprises me even yeah. more is when. Doctors attack doctors in the media or on Twitter, and they're not supporting each other. Like, that just totally blows my mind. Well. I'll and I, we need to come together here. This I, is I will important. let Dr. DuBois Blanc answer that. Where, where do you think that's coming from? Well, again, I think, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the opinions are, are political uh, and just deep, deep-seated, you know, internal beliefs. And, you know, I think I think almost all, all physicians, uh, you know, really, really want to do the right thing. But, but like you said, you know, the, the public health statements where they're, they're allowing, you know, hundreds or groups of a thousand to demonstrate, but again, you can't have more than 12 people in a room. I mean, it just doesn't, that that doesn't, doesn't even pass the common sense test. Um, And it's become a political thing, which is, which is not, uh, you know, the way that, that this should work. I, I, I agree. So again, politics has nothing to do with clinic, clinical science or anything else. Um, but Susan, one thing that people don't know is that doctors are trained in an environment where they're used to beating the crap out of each other constantly. <laughs> and it's, it's a military system where we beat the crap out of each other. Yeah, but it's and, not political. No, no, it's, that's on. different. Hold on. But when, when some of that continues into the public sphere or the social media sphere, it, it looks different. It becomes, it, it just takes a different form than that thing we're used to, to sharpen the edge of our clinical skill, which we're always holding each other accountable. Then it becomes weird and political out in the, in the, in the um, social media context. It really is not, I, I don't know. It, it, we just weren't meant to be doing that publicly. We do it to each other in our yeah. hospital settings. And You're in used training. to it, but I'm, I'm not, well, yeah. social media is a whole nother forum too. I mean, there's things that people say on social media that you would never say, you know, face to face with somebody. Uh, and so doctors are, are very cannibalistic on social media. That is for sure. They'll yeah. eat their own. Well, yeah. Uh, and, and that that's, again, I think that sort of grows out of our training. I, I don't know what, what would, I don't know. Uh, again, I, I don't have a strong opinion about what, what we're doing as a profession. We, we, we have not certainly, um, uh, We've we've allowed people who don't have clinical judgment to take over, and I and I'm not sure that was a, a good plan. I mean, that's why I kept telling everyone to just watch Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci. Those are practicing physicians. Those are people that have a, a you know risk reward analysis in their head. Uh, you you may not know this, uh, Dr. Boys Blanc, but I was uh, I was around. I was working hard in the AIDS epidemic. Mm-hmm. What's that? Good you news. said it like me. De Bois Blanc, de Bois Blanc. <laughs> like, oh, come on, Francais. The, uh, and I, I, Fauci back then was uh, urging us to go out. There was I just remember him saying, there's going to be 10 million dead, 10 million dead. You've got, to, you've got to change people's behavior. It's why I got on the radio in 1984, because of his urging to go out and educate. Um, and I, and I you know, watched him ever since and have known him to be an extremely cautious, conservative, high-quality scientist with good clinical judgment, so listen to him. That's all we really kind of had to do is just uh, let, let him guide us through this. And, um, I, you know, now he's talking about opening schools. Now he's talking about, uh, you know, just practicing social distancing, which is what he recommended in the first place. And, and I've said this from the beginning of that pandemic, and we will be fine. We will be fine with this thing. And, and the other thing I tried to get people to understand is, you know, we've been through multiple other pandemics. And to, were you practicing in 2009 when we had the H1N1? I was, um, but you know, it was, you know, basically we just had a few extra flu patients in the hospital. You know, it wasn't uh, hugely impacting our our social life or anything like that. Well, but it sounds like the the hospital burden was very similar to COVID. I would say it was probably more. Right. Uh, 
And I got H1N1. It was brutal. It killed young people. It didn't just kill old people. And uh, it killed 500,000 people. And we didn't even know it happened. That, that, I was just trying to get everybody to calibrate their emotions in response to this thing. <clears throat> but um, to be fair, we didn't know quite where it was going. Did you, did you ever feel we would be like Italy? Did you ever have that concern? Well, yeah. I mean, when Italy started going down, I mean, the, it looked it looked uh, really bad in Italy. But, you know, I, I, I thought that the U.S. health system is is way more resource intensive than Italy's. That's right. And so I knew I knew that, you know, our our ability to take care of patients uh, was going to be way more than than their, their, their ability. I mean, they have, they have huge inner city hospitals that have five ventilators, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, we've got 50 ventilators every day here. So, yeah. and we're not a huge, a huge uh, hospital. So I, I knew we were going to be uh, able to take care of a lot more patients, but you know, that, that was the huge fear is, is, are we going to be overwhelmed? And, and nobody wanted to, you know, face those decisions of, you know, who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. I mean, that was I, I, like a big fear. I, I, I understand the fear too. And I, and I get that, that people were preparing for that. But I looked at that and I thought, we are never going to be Italy. We are just not going to be Italy. Not, for the very reason you said, we have so much more resources. We, col- we, we improvise, we create, we, we just do, we're so good. I mean, this, this is the piece that whenever somebody evaluates the U.S. healthcare system, this kind of thing is never a part of the evaluation. And yeah. nobody does this better than us. It just, I just knew it. And I kept saying that too, and uh, and lo and behold, you know, just like what you described your hospital doing, uh, just the ability to prepare and, and to be able to, and they would have met a, a giant surge. It would have been no problem. We would, have, would have been no problem. We were ready. I mean, we were we were going to war against COVID, and 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 we were we were ready. Um, you know, the New York the New York health system was was strained to its max, but but that system at least from what I've heard, I mean, that system normally is sort of at its breaking point That's without right. a pandemic. That's right. No, they, they, that was a whole, New York was like, it, it, I mean, that was a catastrophe. That, that, let's, let's not kid ourselves. I did not see that coming. Well, I kind of did it, it when I changed, when, when Fauci started saying clearly that the R naught was different and that this is more brutal than the flu. And then I started seeing some cases. Um, then New York kind of made sense to me. I still yeah. think they haven't looked at the primary issues, which are the living environments and the elevators, and that that's how it got transmitted. Uh, and unfortunately, they're they're, uh, and and by the way, and again, disproportionately affecting African Americans and other uh, socioeconomically distressed populations. Those living environments uptown and the, uh, way up on the west side, n- no, Mm-mm. they have. To, and those were all government interventions, by the way, all government environments. So, good job, everybody. All right. Just I'm saying any, any thoughts? Uh, did you have any experiences treating much COVID? Do you, did you come away with an understanding of who should be on ventilators and uh, what a cytokine no, storm know, is? Or? From a, from a trauma, trauma surgeon, we didn't uh, uh, really treat too many. The, you know, when it first started, our patients would come in and they would need to be ruled out. And so they were basically cohorted with everybody else uh, who was positive for COVID and, um, and then, you know, patients who were either exposed or there was a concern in the hospital, they got, they got treated. And that was probably the biggest, the biggest thing at the, at the beginning of this, uh, we didn't have very good testing. And right. so right. two thirds of our patients yeah. were, were ruling out for COVID. We thought they, they could have it. So you had to treat them like every other COVID patient. And, and so that was just tearing through every sort of, you know, PPE that we had, uh, and, and that was sort of the biggest, the biggest game changer as far as how, how we took care of these patients uh, over, you know, that four week period of time was that we got better testing. And so we were able to eliminate a tremendous number of patients who were just wasting the PPE. Oh, wow. Um, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at comments on the restream here. And Teresa, you're talking about the 500,000 deaths from uh, H1N1, the swine flu. That was worldwide. Uh, to be fair, that was not the United States. That was worldwide, and it infected one billion people worldwide. Uh, it was a very serious pandemic, and it killed young people. Uh, that was the other thing about it. It did not kill old people. Yeah. It killed young people. Yeah, uh, that's the flu. Yeah. So, well, listen. I know you have to go. I, I really, uh, I, 
I appreciate you coming on and trying to straighten well, things out. Um, do, do you want to try once again to state your position? So, you know, in case anyone tries to distort anything, you've, you've made it very clear again what you were doing, what you meant to say, what they got wrong. Well, I mean, my position, my position uh, t- to start this whole thing was just, you know, uh, there are there are resources out there for 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 suicide prevention. Uh, try and identify people who are at risk, help them out, uh, get them help. Uh, this is a preventable thing, and uh, we really we really don't don't want people to uh, you know be helpless uh, and and think that there's no help for them. So, um, you know really, really, really try and help out uh, and, and prevent this. And let me put a little code on that and say suicide, suicidal thinking always passes, which is why we put people, we sit on people for a couple of days. Do not make a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Suicidal thinking and planning is, is a symptom of severe depression, and it's associated with substance abuse too, as we were talking. Uh, and do not ever take anybody casually when they start talking about uh, thinking about hurting themselves that that is as much a medical emergency as them saying they have chest pain or they're short of breath so or a cough yeah. deal with it accordingly Thank all right you. well uh if we can ever uh, give you an opportunity to you know you need a place to speak out again this this i i urge you to take advantage of us and uh, other outlets because print is not the place to go <laughs> I mean, i'm sure you've now learned <laughs> yes it is thank you very much all right have a great day okay bye-bye all right and uh, we are going to uh, be visited by a friend, uh, Fred Stoller, who's, I believe, going to be checking in with me. Is that true, Susan? Yes. Is he's he... testing out his... Uh, it, we're checking in with a friend. Okay. And he... I always worry about Fred Stoller, so... Well, he was in the middle of all the riots, so... Right. The, uh, we... he's, I'm going to do that. I'm Hi from around. Germany there. I see you guys. Uh, Mad Lib. Hi, man. Uh, we appreciate your comments here on the Restream. If you have any questions here, just stick them on there, and I'll try to get to them. Uh, somebody saying we had a scary moment. Oh, he had a scary moment. Well, I mean, it's it's not scary. It's just it, just un- so deeply unpleasant when when you're a guy like him and he's at the high trauma surgeons are, the, are really seriously extraordinary professionals, and when you mistreat them for describing their clinical observations, you you are you are doing that is it's it's violence. You're doing them violence. And uh, I, unfortunately, we have no ability to uh, contain these people who are, are, are acting out on, on good people. Nobody's going to want to go into these professions. It's just not going to be worth it to anybody. Good luck with that in the future. I mean, uh, do I think COVID was as bad as they said it would be? Well, I did never thought it was going to be as bad as they said it would be. So uh, I thought it was worse than I expected. And that's why I apologized early because I uh, got that wrong. The brutality in older people and the the significance of the are not when it was in the midst of a particular place like New York City. Uh, do we have Fred? I'm so excited. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Fred. <laughs> no one's been too excited about me before except Susan. <laughs> no, I'm excited about you, buddy. I like you. I'm excited, too, to have you. So how are you this morning? I'm not bad. Not bad. So you you kept giving us uh, scary uh, footage on Instagram as you'd walk out of your apartment and over to the. Uh, well, if you hear market. a helicopter there right now, they still. Today was the first day they didn't have the National Guard at the farmers market. Did you see the footage of tank after tank after tank? I, I did, and I also saw what the aftermath of the the rioting was in farmers market. Yeah, you know, it was last Saturday. It was so surreal watching the local news and also hearing it outside my apartment. I'm right by Melrose Avenue, Fairfax, and uh, they would go down Oakwood Avenue, my block. All the people were diverted through here. And you hear a helicopter now. It's kind of funny. I My, my biggest joy is doing cameos. I, I We've talked about that. And I feel like I'm not an essential worker. I'm not elevating myself, but I get so many... So when the when COVID first was, you know, in its infancy, I mean, you know, I would have to do give pep talks to hospital, overworked hospital workers, pep talks, to people who have it, yeah. essential workers. And I go, who who am I to give pep talks to? Don't they know who I am? But I had to keep <laughs> <a> morale <laughs> He's the most depressed so, person. 
<laughs> and I'd hear so they go, give us a pep talk. She works in a hospital in England and or this one is in a and now it's not as dramatic being uh, working at, you know, essential workers, meaning not hospital, but like he works, you know, a clerk in the store. And yeah, yeah. So now we're not looking at them as such heroes because we're going into those stores. But um, but I, I, I at the end of the day and I was only charging five dollars because I just felt I was like helping the morale up. And I felt I was emotionally exhausted, like someone who you know works in a hospital, doing cameos. Well, but I'm glad I you did. There's helicopters outside all the time. It gave you meaning, gave them some some uh, yes. a little bit of a surge, uh, so to speak. So, so describe to people where you are, because again, there are people are on the restream are like, "Where's Fred? How did he? Why is he in the middle of this?" You're right by well, Farmers Market. Um, the first protest was at Pan Pacific Park, which is a a block right next to the Grove. And it was a very peaceful, uh, there was the first LA one, Pan Pacific Park, right by Farmer's Market next to it. And I lived right there. And then I guess um, it got weird. And then it went out, I went out and then showed you that footage when I was on Fairfax Avenue and it was peaceful. It was very uh, heartening. Um, people, cars standing up with signs. And then I, I, then I started thinking what you were saying, wait a minute. I'm getting pretty brazen, even with my mask. Like the first few weeks of COVID, I'd be grumbling. There's that jerk without a mask, or even if someone with a mask came too close to me outside. And I go, Fred, I was freaking out a day before. Now all of a sudden, this is almost like it reminds me of when, like in the old days, someone like Marv Albert would have a controversy. And then the next guy, celebrity, we forgot about Marv Albert. It's like we forgot about COVID now. Yeah. You know, it doesn't exist. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, we found a cure. It's demonstrated. Yes, yes, protesting. Protest, so, yes. Protest. Um, so then I went home and then so sad. You know, I've been in this neighborhood since 95. No, 92. I love this neighborhood. My, you, you've you come here. You always say mm -hmm. you love the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. I do. And um, is, it, is it open back up again? I have a video. It... I have the video you sent me. Of farmer's market? Yeah, can I play it? Okay, one second. I want to hear how it's doing okay, go now. Ahead. How is it doing now? Okay. It, it was closed for a few days. Um, they had a, you know, uh, the, the Grove is shut. It's uh, barricaded with wooden uh, fences or whatever. Like, the, you know, the Grove is still shut. Farmer's Market is open. Uh, and they have the, na they have the National Guard out there for days. Hmm. Let's, let's look at the um, video that you took. Let's see if it works. Okay. I'm hopeful. I, I'm you just so learning how to this, do this. Isn't? I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying new stuff. <laughs> Oh, it's sideways. That's right. Came from the farmer's market. Where? This is the worker's house. This is the Harvard transportation. Oh, you might be able to hear the inside. Farmer's market. Ready? We're ready. We're ready. I'm working on my lawsuit with Dr. Drew. We got two lawsuits going on. All right, I'm going home now. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's at that. the end, he no, says something funny. That's Can, not the one I wanted. I wanted the one where you walk through the grove. That I have that, that somewhere, but there, it's coming out sideways. I don't know how to turn it around. I just you know, it Drew, on. I have to say, though, in 92, I was here for those riots. That was almost more chilling seeing Jeeps go down the street. Mm. Jeeps was pretty freaky. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's all pretty freaky, let's be fair. I mean, it's... Um, I felt like you were more secure, though, when the National Guard came. Like, it made, gave you sort of a relief. Are you, are you frightened going out now in your neighborhood? No, not, not, not at all. I mean, I have this irrational... Actually, they had another protest here. This irrational thing is, like, the looters did what they needed to do with the Grove and Fairfax Avenue and Melrose Avenue. Um... You know, I, I, I'm not a sociologist, people will argue, but it seemed in 92, that was more about the rage in their neighborhoods. And, but this is almost like it came shopping, like it came to the Grove and 
Beverly Center and Beverly Hills, like more, you know what I mean? Not, it's different than other riots. Uh, and, and so do you, you, as you're back, I'm going to talk to you like a sociologist. Do you feel it sort of had a, a course to it, much like the virus has had a course. It just had an escalation, a de-escalation, and and that's the end well, of it? it. It seems the the well, it's going on. I it's going on still, but I think the violent part is like we we did these. It's like you know we took over cities, like going to Berlin. You know what I mean? Making its way in, like we did the Grove. You know, I mean the the, the agitators. You know, the violent part, um, the looting. They 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 can't go to these places twice so i'm not i'm not afraid at all outside no Good. i'm more sad sad of what you know i have a friend i probably won't talk to again because he's very staunch um i can't i can't be friends close friends with people you can't express yourself to i could be a peripheral friend of someone but when you know just different things and um the divisiveness did you see that thing with rock the rock making that plea to the president uh no well, tell me about it oh you gotta see it on instagram the rock makes an eight minute plea where is our leader and and it, it feels surreal like you're in a movie starring the rock <laughs> about aliens coming down where is our leader <laughs> I ask you, please unite us. We need a leader. And it, it just feels, yes, like a crazy rock movie starring The Rock where he's going to save the world. I, I actually do agree with him. We, we need somebody to emerge. Uh, uh, I love The Rock. And I'm not sure it's from the government necessarily. I, we, we need somebody to emerge to sort of unify. And um, I don't know how we do that. I don't know how that works. But uh, we I agree with him. I, well, I that hasn't him. been, you know, the MO of, you know, Trump, uh, you know, to, I mean, other presidents could fake it, but, you know, um, yeah. I, um, to be more frivolous, I'm waiting to get the haircut still. And we were going to do a Zoom with my hair guy. I'm waiting for Susan to set it up. Okay. I still, now, what is your, oh, I have my first uh, showbiz job post COVID. So oh. I wanted to get your advice. What, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, a little part on Rick and Morty. Oh, how fun. That's cool. So oh my, my question, my talk question. To, hey, man, if I can get even a cameo on that, I might, my, my esteem well, in the talk eyes about of my children. Cameo. Hey, what we, happened is um, I used to be friends with Justin Roiland, who co-created, and he does the voices. You know, we lost touch. You know, he's blown up, as the kids say. And, um, and he so then his friends asked me last Saturday during the riots, oh, and the cameos requests have gone down since riots. Have you noticed that people, you, it's just a weird thing. So I did a cameo for Justin Roiland, you know, the friends thought it was a joke, you know, and, you know, joke. And the next day I got a little offer. I guess the cameo reminded him of me. Oh, wow. So my question is, um, what are the risks going into a studio where people are like slobbering? Yeah. Um, you're, you know, you should wear a mask. You're going to be in the sound booth by yourself. When you're, I obviously have to take the mask off. Yes. And when you're in the control room, put the mask on. That's obviously a very high risk environment. Um, but that's it. I mean, just, just don't keep, touch your lips on the mic. Yeah. Keep the social distancing just the way you do and just wear them. What mask. if the guy before me was hello, that when it was voice of a voice of a guy slobbering? And well, they need to, they need to disinfect the mics and stuff. Yeah. Or use, they, they should use Lysol yeah. in the air, yeah, right? They should. Yes. And I'm sure they will. Cause it, sure it, will. you said yesterday it doesn't transfer off of surfaces. It's more yeah. of an airborne thing. Right. And th I mean, there was a bunch of data flying around today about how many hours it stays in the air. Look, the, the transmission when, when it transmits, it's because somebody is next to somebody in a closed environment for, I think the average is three days. So it's not like you're likely to get it every time somebody coughs in a room. It's just not that likely if particularly people are practicing the right distancing and the, and the masks and everything. So it, it's just, and you see the demonstrations, people without masks, people screaming and still Bring no, some no, Lysol. no real transmission. I mean, the data is just static. So you know, so I've read the other tape, and I think I might have figured out how to make it go 
sideways, but it might be upside down. So let's let's show that <laughs> so one. Let's see. This is the one in the I wish I could market. I could get the sound to work too. Well, can we can, can we do voiceover over it? Yeah, let me just transition. Oops. Okay. Oops, right. It's not there. there <laughs> That's not it. Mm -hmm. Let me let me fix it. Maybe I erased it when I did. I have a controversial question about COVID that'll get people mad at me. Uh oh, go ahead. My sister and her husband got it. Took them five weeks to get over it, and they live in Rockland County in New York, not in the crowded elevator area. You say, yeah. And he goes to uh, NA meetings. Good. So we Good. suspect he got it there. Well, the but NA meetings a... were all canceled. It was all done by Zoom. No, no. This is this is Prior. a month ago. Okay, Prior. got it. Yeah. Okay. And they suspect he got it. That area had a big influx. Hasidic population. I live on a, a street down. There's a lot of Hasidics, Jews. Mm -hmm. It's just controversial. They don't seem to wear masks. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. And, and I know there were some outbreaks, as you know, in, uh, in Hasidic communities in uh, New Rochelle and other areas. So again, sort that's of where, yeah, the area my sister and her husband got it. Oh, uh, well, that and was it, that was the, that's just a fact. That's just what happened. So that's not controversial. But, but saying Hasidic Jews don't wear the won't wear oh, the masks. Oh, I, I don't know about the not wearing the mask stuff. I, I, no, I don't no. know why they wouldn't. But um, I see them; they don't in this area most. Well, they may be practicing distancing, and I I don't know, I don't know. That's my uh, controversy. I wish I had done this in advance, but I called Fred like five minutes before the show. Mm -hmm. But let's see; it's so going to be so this will be. She's, she's apologizing for, I for me. Well, no, my videos. I don't. I have to. Oh, I thought this. you meant for me being not very. No, no, no. no, no you no, look no. great. I, no, I'm. I like your hair. But let's see if this works sideways. Oh, it's sideways. Now. Fred, didn't you do one where you walked through the farmer's market? I, I, I did, but... Yeah. Um, we're not going to see that one, obviously. <laughs> well, you were you were saying I, I, something about them not on Facebook not allowing you to show the fire. Oh, no, no. I, I, I'm not one of these Facebook conspiracy guys, but when I walked down that street towards where cop cars were burning, my Facebook live feed would go out. So yeah. I don't know. But I was walking towards where many cop cars were on fire. What happened? Did the police abandon their cars? I'm, I'm curious why so many went on fire. Uh, they just got pelted? Yeah, I think the, the surge of uh, protesters came through the cop cars, and uh, and then they tried to push it back, and that took that, that's where they started doing bad things. So Yeah, uh, they, they got pushed behind their cars, and the cars just got it. it it's all very... It's only money. Yeah, this is all. I, I get upset when I think about the whole thing. It's all very, very challenging. And I hope, we, I hope we've done our thing. I hope that's you know all we're gonna see. I mean, Fred was so afraid, and he went outside, and he was like, he's like, should I? I am I gonna get COVID now? <laughs> like, well, so I would. I was just saying, kidding around. I'm gonna sue Dr. Drew if I get it, because you're the one who keeps saying you probably can't get it outside. <laughs> if you wear a mask and social distance outdoors, you're really not gonna get it. Let if me you wear a mask question. and social distance. Go ahead. Fauci, was he saying at first, there's all this stuff that at first he wasn't encouraging masks? What's the story? At the beginning, they, the government, all the government officials were saying, do not wear masks. They, I believe, were primarily motivated because they wanted to preserve the masks for the frontline people. They didn't want the general public consuming all the masks so there wouldn't be enough personal protective gear for the frontline people. Then, and then Governor Cuomo outlawed the wearing of masks. 
And so he made, he, he made a couple of moves that really might have hurt people. He made nursing homes keep people with infectious, you know, with, with COVID. He outlawed the use of masks. And they all backed off of that and then went enthusiastically in favor of the masks. I can tell you in the 1918 Spanish flu, they believed the masks stopped the whole thing. That there was really no transmission when people were wearing masks. So there's uh, there's historical evidence that that's a reasonable way to go. Wow. Yeah. Well, I I I, I need, I'm not too good at cleaning them, but um, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I was I thinking about that. Out. I fi- I find random masks all over the house and yours and and the boys. I just they're coming like, sitting here. I usually like yours. after these I your, use your those fancy, are fresh. Uh, those are fresh. We just got those, but um, fancy, uh, but I. But I always take mine after I'm done and put it in a plastic baggie, not set it on the table, the dining room table or whatever. It's like it, all the virus is in the mask. So it's probably better if you just, you have to wash them. Just wash them. Yeah, and wash also them not, don't just come home and throw them next to the telephone. Like Smart. it's Smart. That's yeah. what my kids do. Like I find these random masks all over the place. I'm like, well, if you got something, you know, you're going to pass it to the whole house. So yeah. How about we keep it in your pocket or throw it in the washing machine? I won't be as neurotic outside, but at first, my fight or flight bad, you know, instinct, which I've worked hard against, came back. Oh, this guy, this guy, you know what I mean? Like this whole, everyone's a threat. That thing, you know, everyone is a possible, can ruin my life. Everyone who passes, you asshole, why aren't you wearing a mask? <laughs> you, know, you know, but now I, you, you told, you kind of reassured me, you know, I would hate joggers, idiots that don't have, you know, uh, yeah. Hey, but Fred, speaking not- of uh, voiceover, did you see my my midnight gospel, the midnight gospel that I did. Oh, I, uh, I got to see that. It's uh, really good. Um, it's a uh, D- Duncan Trussell and uh, it's really an amazing watch. Watch the first one and the last one. Uh, I'm in the first <laughs> one and then the last one will make you cry. So it's a, it's I, uh, yeah, but watch the ones in between too. Well, of course they're all really good. It's brilliant. You know, uh, Jew, my other friend, Jew, Jew, uh, Carrie sent me a text to watch it. I wonder how they're going to do the prices right. I'm not worried about your carry, but some, some, what's going to happen with the uh, live audiences and TV shows? Uh, it's going to be the, uh, maybe by the fall. I mean, it's possible this thing goes to essentially zero by the fall. Now the question is, will it come back? That's the question. We don't know. How, how is Drew doing? He, he had a major uh, loss, uh, really, oof. Same thing with Mark Marin and both those guys this year. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, um, I had worked with that that his uh, girlfriend. I did a little part on his uh, IFC show. You know, I, I Drew was very uh, blown away. He, they broke up, but they, you know, he cared. He loved her deeply. He helped her buy her house and. I, I mean, I knew her fairly well. She was at that birthday party you were at. She mm-hmm. was there that night, yep. my 60th. And it was just like, um, they never had her uh, service because COVID um, Oh my hit. gosh. They didn't have a funeral for her. So it was very, very upsetting. Yes, she got thrown out a window. What's what's happening with law, with trials and People like people that, you know, Spousal who are abuse. waiting they're for backlogged. their trial. Are they having trials? No, they're backlogged. I, I, I understand they, they, you know, because you have a constitutional right to a speedy trial, they're going to have to do something about that. But yes, yeah. they're, they're worried about it. If I'm a guy that's innocent and I'm waiting for my trial, it's like, man, would they do any Zoom trials with juries? I, I don't. Maybe maybe the the the, uh, the settlement. What do you call it when somebody just adjudicates, uh, but not a trial? Deposition. No. Yeah. You can't really because they might Google stuff while they're. Hey, using. Edgardo, uh, what you have a question about prostate cancer? Uh, go to PCF.org, Prostate Cancer Foundation. PCF.org is a great resource for you. Also, um, Susan, we're supposed to uh, give a phone number. Uh, for the sand minis. Uh, oh. Uh, and and by the way, you can get can. you can get these um, these great uh, thermometers too. What's which it I called again? The Ooh. thermometer. Uh, this, What's the name on it? It's on the side. It's um, Burcom. B e r r c o m. 
Uh, shoot, I don't see the web the phone number here. Uh, but I, I, I really, uh, I'm a strong advocate for checking. You keep telling me there's a phone number and nobody sends it to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm looking. It's not on the website. So. If this is anything positive, toilet paper is available on Amazon. It's not, but it was. Good. You that's good. Get. I need some paper towels. Everything except disinfectant. I got paper towels, toilet paper, tissues. Is there a website, honey? It's not as hard. Is there a website that people can go to? Uh, the same, I just the, went to Amazon. No more it's not at no more sharps dot com. No more sharps. Uh, but I don't see the phone. But number. they have the thermometer on the no more sharps dot com. They website. don't seem to. Uh, so I, I thought there was a different number for that. So oh, yeah. Google it. I'm just gonna put the name of it up. People can Google it. It's okay. such a great thermometer. I, know. I love it. I know. Everyone should have one in their pocket. I know. And every and before, it, I completely agree with that. Uh, okay. I mean, I, last night we went to dinner with my son who hasn't been went out. To a house. restaurant? Yeah. yeah he hasn't been greatest. out for three months. And we what was to, it like? It was nice. It was, it was, the we, police we showed up at one point, too. got a little nerve wracking, but. Yeah. It's, it's weird being at the distancing. Uh, you know what I mean? But they, but the, all the waiters had on a mask and a shield over their face and they were, you know, they felt very protected. They're very cute. And, um. My son was kind of, he, he just looked kind of dazzled by it because it's just so strange to go out and have somebody cook for you and pick up and bring you whatever you want. And because, uh, you know, he's been making himself a quesadilla twice a day for three <laughs> months. All, all restaurants in L.A. open then? No, only a few. Like if you go to Open Table, you can find one in your local area, but they can only take so many people. It's everybody's spread apart. But it's it's such an interesting feeling, you know, when you first go out, you know, like, it just and then the it's Mi Piace in, in Pasadena and the guy who who owns it has been there. I mean, he's been there for about 40 years, right? 35 yeah. years because we started going there when we were in our 20s and he stayed open by having takeout and, you know, he owns the place. He he ran the whole thing and he's got a, a huge amount of employees. Uh, the the rent there is thirty five thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So it's I mean, I'm surprised that he he Survived made it through. It. Yeah. But it was everybody was running around in circles. It was it was a little nerve wracking because, you know, we you have to be on the lookout for anybody who wants to do harm on the street. But we, you know, we got in and out pretty fast, and and people seemed really happy. It was it was a nice experience. Yes, it's just going. It feels like you're you're restoring your life. It's so crazy, and then participating, supporting somebody's right. business. Drew has a, a gift certificate because he has one patient that likes to give him a gift certificate to the restaurant. And he's like, well, maybe I won't use it this time. No, I'm <laughs> not going to use it because we got to support their business. I mean, I that's, that's, the way, that's the way it goes. But he stayed he stayed alive, and he he was delivering food all over the city and. He has a, you know, great staff, amazing food. And if you like Pasadena, um, check it out. It's it's an amazing place. And we supported some stuff in Orange County, too. which is When you when someone food. mentioned prostate cancer. Yeah. Um, I, my question is, are there other we forget that there's other ways threats in our life besides COVID. Of course. And, uh, oh, this person died of cancer. I forgot about that. Well, wait a minute. Uh, before this, so are people n not going to doctors? And are, yes. There were other consequences? Yes. Because oh, they're ma afraid massive. they're not going to doctors? The, the, the whole interview we did before you came on today was about that. The mental health uh, consequences and the fact that delayed operations and the fact that people weren't getting their proper screening procedures and they weren't getting their you know, chemotherapies on time. Yes, it's had massive, massive, massive consequences. And this has been my point, which is when you shut things down, you have to do a risk reward analysis. And these people that are making these decisions aren't used to doing that or don't know how to do that appears, certainly not medically. And now we're seeing suicides and impact on children. And it's just, it's all over the place, what we've done here. So we need to, we need to get people's lives back as quickly as possible. A friend of mine speculated that Mark Marin's girlfriend died, not of COVID, but if it wasn't for COVID, they may have seen her. They said, uh, let the fever go away. It's not COVID. And they thought it was a, they said it's not COVID and she would have gone to the hospital soon and it might have been different. That's exactly right. So there was a suggested. lot of that. She I'll, had I, COVID? I, I, no, she probably didn't. No, no, but... she had something else, but they thought it was COVID. Oh, it's not COVID. It'll go away. 
and she might have gone to the doctor sooner that they were waiting for a COVID result when yep. she might have been treated sooner had they not been ruling out COVID. Uh, uh, or, or see the other, there, there's, yes, there's that side, but there's also people, she wouldn't want to go to the hospital because of fear of getting COVID if she didn't have sure. it. So there's yes. two forces at work there. You know, she, it's very sad, really sad. I feel terrible for Mark. I sent him a note. I, uh, he's just, just awful. And and by the way, that woman affected lots of people's lives. Everybody I know had, a lot of people I knew had some connection with her and were just, ugh, this was a big loss. Yeah, yeah. So. I am um, sorry. Well, it was I'm, his business partner, right? It wasn't his wife. His yeah, you know, I did It was his girlfriend. Of, yeah. Oh. IFC show. But yeah, business partner, partner. She directed his stand-up special. She directed his, uh, and she directed, uh, what was the thing? The the wrestling uh, Netflix show. Glow. Yeah. Glow. But she but she was his girlfriend too, right? Wasn't he? Yes. Wasn't yeah. That's Speaking of Netflix, Jimmy's coming on. His his show's the number one show on Netflix. Yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we need to talk on. about Speaking that. Speaking of blowing up, well, Jimmy's not on Netflix. Jimmy's is on Amazon. We're gonna have him on tomorrow, Monday, two p.m. Oh, you mean the space? The space. Uh, he can talk us. about it. You yeah. talk about that, Fred? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just, so Jimmy's on Space Force, but he also has a stand-up special. I heard on, number one. The, the stand-up special on Amazon is really, really, really good. He's a great stand-up. I love Jimmy. I met yeah, him. But I he's met not him like through a you. Greg, oh yes, he's not like a Greg Fitzsimmons. He's got to do it well before COVID every night. He uh, he did his special, and then staying away from clubs. I mean, before COVID, just acting and writing and. So he's not one of these guys that has to do it like, you know, Joe Rogan and stuff. But well, I, I though saw yeah. him, I saw, well, I don't, I don't think I was with you. I saw him at the ice house and uh, it, it's, it's a lot of the same stuff is in the special and it was very good. Very, very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, All right, my good. friend. Well, thank you for sharing. Right. I, well, maybe we were talking, maybe we could do a zoom haircut, but my, my guy, he would over zoom show me, how to cut my hair and people could learn how to cut their own hair if they're still afraid well we had a guy on uh, the dr drew after dark show that would cut his hair by feathering it with a lighter (laughs) Uh, i don't know if i want to yeah i don't want you to do that i don't want you to rest in peace i can help too Uh, i went went to beauty college yeah susan knows how to cut hair she's done it all right (laughs) right, i think it'll look i think your hair looks pretty good though fred i like that kind of Tussly right, look I'll on you. Well, <laughs> right. Talking to you guys. Don't worry, I'm fine here. All right, man. We well, love come, you, Fred. We'll, I'll come to Farmers Market. It's another place I want to support. And the tables are back. I know my boys would like to go too. Yeah, it's okay. They love it down we'll there. Six feet apart. All right, guys. You have a great day. Thanks, Fred. God bless. Uh, I'm now Thanks. looking at the um, the data here uh, just to get the COVID tracking project data because it's the uh, University of Washington is about a week behind typically, and the uh, the positive testing rate is generally at about two thousand, two thousand, two thousand. Then it jumped to three thousand yesterday, and about yeah, about another thirty five hundred today. So there's a little uptick in California. It looks like uh, I don't think it's being reflected in the hospitalization rate, but they don't really have that data. Uh, let's look at New York, another place where people really were on top of each other. So uh, as I predicted, we're going to see a little uptick. I just don't think we're going to see much. Uh, we so. were watching the BBC this morning mm-hmm. and apparently in the EU, it's it's starting to go up again and they're getting really stressed out about it. Mm. You know, a be. Whenever the press reports something, I know, I know. Check I, it. I should know better than that. Yeah, because although but the BBC was, is pretty good, mm-hmm. what do they mean by going up? That's the part I, I want to. Well, talk they were about. like they want more p- people to stay home. I mean, yes, it is going up uh, uh, here too, but I don't think it's going to make any difference. So, looking at New York, uh, the positivity rate. You know, looking back a week, we we're about a uh, thousand, and then I'm sorry, about. Two, what is that number? Oh, here we go. Uh, about a week, we've got 1,000, 1,000, 900, 1,500. So it's really not changing very much in New York. So you're not seeing yeah. a significant uptick. And a, a reminder that 80% of all COVID has become symptomatic within seven days. 
And we are about 11 days into the uh, demonstration. Tomorrow, New York's so going into phase one. I found out it was tomorrow. It's not going it into phase one. That's mm-hmm. great. That is good news. I know. So people can let workers in. and Yeah, phase one. Phase two is where you really start to feel like you're coming back a little bit. Uh, let me look at Georgia, which I've always said was our canary in the coal mine since they picked the exact wrong moment to begin moving about. <laughs> uh, oh, very flat. A little uptick. Nah, not really. Nah, very flat. Uh, let's check the hospitalization rates. Come on. Mm. Got the colored wheel spinning. Just a second. It's all right. And then Everybody's Florida's still okay. having their coffee. Yeah, and then Florida's the other thing I want to check. At least here I am. Can. Did anybody see my uh, housekeeper walk in front of the camera? <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't go that far. We, we, what we saw you is I, throwing and flying across the camera. Did you see me? Yes. Uh, uh, so hang on. Please. I know. She, she doesn't know. It's about the same. And then finally, let me go to Florida. I love her. Uh, she th- she's Florida's Polish. And nice she, and flat. We have a photo of Drew and, and Teresa with a six-foot Oh, yardstick and her sister in Poland saw it. She Flo- was very excited. Oh, that's fun. Florida, little uptick, little uptick in Florida. Uh, that may be significant. That's very interesting. If that's not because uh, we had seen a couple of days in various states where there was a sudden uptick and that probably was a backlog of testing. But here in Florida, let me just give you a sense of the trend. So it's 1,200, then 900, then 700, then 600, then 600. Then thirteen hundred, then fourteen hundred. So it's uh, it might be a real trend there. We'll see. All right. Uh, so I, I generally though just know the trend is down. Generally the trend is down. Generally we are. Uh, it, it's a little foggy in terms of where we are because um, you know of all the movement and all the lack of distancing, which could screw us up. I mean, it could do it, but I think. One of two things is simply the case. This thing has either run its course, which, think about it. I mean, the, people are going, I don't understand. How is this possible? How could it have run its course? Uh, think about cold season. Colds, coronaviruses cause colds most of the time. And when do you get colds? In the winter. And it comes and it goes. And then the viruses are gone. You don't have the cold viruses in the summer. And although this coronavirus is different, it may follow that same pattern of seasonality. Or... It's just gone completely, in which case it will not be back in the fall. I wouldn't count on that. I wouldn't count on that. That seems a little too uh, too too good to be true. Uh, Monica Ricci is telling us that Georgia's open bars and nightclubs this weekend. So, Susan, we can go to Atlanta if you want to and visit your friends. I'm Su- in. All right. They want to they want to go somewhere more tropical. Okay. Uh, okay. I've been experiencing coagulation issues. Uh, you should see a hematologist, Natalie. See a hematologist uh, for sure. Uh, Texas is opening up. Uh, t- Adam Carolla was in Texas uh, two weeks ago, 10 days ago, and he said he would not have known it was different, you know, it was anything unusual about anything. Everything seemed open and normal. So different states are experiencing this very differently. That in California, we've been in total panic mode, total lockdown, and we're opening up very slowly. Had it not been for the demonstrations, it would have been even slower. So it looks like we're going to be able to cut our hair next week and uh, all those good things. So uh, by the same token, uh, mental health services should be uh, once again in full swing. So please, if you're feeling uh, out of sorts as a result of all these uh, upheavals, get some help. Uh, I hope uh, joining us here once a day helps you sort of feel connected in some way and that you know we can regain our lives and regain normalcy. We will get there. Uh, however, I do, um, I do feel the, you know, I'm prone to depression myself and anxiety. And so I feel all that as well. And I, I get it. I get how difficult it is. I so. think being able to go out to dinner has been really nice. Essential. But e- even that feels, I, I still need to be able to see the future that, that has been helpful, but I still feel like there needs to be a future for all of us. And, uh, that is still so uncertain. There's so much turmoil that it is is become difficult to do so what about so, the movie industry like you can't even go to the movies anymore amc probably going to go out of business that's what i read oh. uh, yesterday or I last think, week yeah so yeah it's but good. i mean why can't they just like put distance between everybody in the theater yeah because you know yeah. some theaters you can buy your seat or in make advance. you wear the masks 
wear a mask mm-hmm. and sit, you know, put two or three seats between each couple. Yep. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for. Uh, we'll figure it out. We're going to have to figure it out. We will. Uh, we'll stay with it. Again, if you have questions about prostate cancer, uh, go to PCF.org. Uh, I myself have prostate cancer. I uh, had my operation about nine years ago uh, and have been relatively good ever since. Uh, so You're perfect. Well, I, I have a slight tick in my in my. I, a slight persistence, but everything in my still prostate works. Specific antigen, yes, everything is. The surgery you had was a, a great complete surgery. Success. Yes, that was all good. Um, but uh, if you want to, int- I, I can start to talk more about the illnesses that, 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 and the causes I'm involved with more chronically. So it is PCF.org, Prostate Cancer Foundation. If you want to be, if you have anyone with that in your family, and back, by the way, back to African Americans and the Black Lives Matter movement, African Americans genetically have are prone to more aggressive forms of prostate cancer and are for whatever reasons less likely to come in to get the proper screening so don't be afraid of covid go in and get checked please get your prop get your get your prostate psa get your psa uh, because there are excellent the treatment of prostate cancer has has led the way now in cancer treatment of so many other uh cancers including including uh, ovarian breast uh and uh the the sort of what we call the personalized uh approach to cancer treatment now is just unbelievable it's really so i just had my mammogram and i wasn't afraid it was great i was the only person in there yeah get your screening done they Uh, separate everybody don't don't put it off Uh, get your colonoscopies and all those things if the centers are starting to do them again please Uh, that's uh, and and do uh, don't check out also if you have someone in your family with colon cancer stomach cancer breast cancer uh prostate cancer you might want to check out color.com you can get uh cancer screening done there it's don't forget to mention there. the national suicide prevention lifeline you got that number for us it's a it's right over your head uh and patrick uh you asking on monoclonal antibodies again those studies are underway we will not have anything real from that for another couple of months i suspect uh, but those are really exciting i think by august september we'll be able to talk about using monoclonal antibodies to treat and prevent uh covid which may be part of why the fall, even if, if the virus comes back, is going to be so different than uh, what this outbreak has been. So, all right, everybody, uh, stay safe out there. We appreciate you stopping by here. We will be in tomorrow. Jimmy O Yang is stopping by, uh, and uh, we will uh, see you all tomorrow.